In a world brimming with data and endless possibilities, a revolution is unfolding right before our eyes. Welcome to the era of artificial intelligence. In the mid 20th century, with the birth of computer science, visionaries dreamt of machines that could mimic human intelligence. Fast forward to today, and AI is not just a dream, it's an integral part of our daily lives. From navigating uncharted roads autonomously to revolutionizing healthcare by predicting disease, AI is reshaping our world. It is in our homes, our phones, even in the way we communicate and entertain ourselves. The future of AI holds mysteries that even the brightest minds are yet to unravel. Imagine AI that not only explores distant planets, but also safeguards our own. Envision AI as a key to unlock solutions to climate change and a companion in enhancing our own human potential. Join us on this incredible journey as we explore the wonders and promises of artificial intelligence. The future is here and it's waiting for us to redefine the impossible. In this episode of The Futurist, I'm bringing you some really exciting stories when it comes to artificial intelligence. We're going to take a deep dive into drug development and drug discovery processes that are completely changing because of AI. We'll also get into the music industry, industrial revolutions, and robotics. Keep watching, and thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Ian Khan, and I'm your host. In our first segment, I want us to take a deep dive into the current breakdown of the healthcare sector and how we are betting our lives on systems and technologies that are maximized their potential. The major issue society is facing nowadays is that we don't have a true healthcare system. We have a reactive sickness care system and provider of care. And we need to shift to being much more proactive, moving the intervention to early stage, to much more personalized approach to the risks, the risk being genetics, blood biomarkers, imaging, family history, environment, and much more. The current system is not sustainable. It costs too much, and with life expectancy and demography uh, changes, Society cannot afford one size does not fit all. By definition, we need to be personalized and early. And this, hopefully, will be gradually um, achieved using AI and technology together with biology. While researching content for this episode of The Futurist, we really were flooded with many different stories but one of them really stood out, and that was the story of Curis.ai, a company that's changing the way drugs are created, and essentially the research for drugs is happening. This process of drug discovery is what is fundamentally changing the nature of the future of the entire drug and pharmaceutical industry. In order to find out, I spoke to the CEO of Curis. I spoke to Isaac Bentovich, who gave us the insights on where the industry has been, where it is today, and where it's headed. Let's hear more. AI's advanced analytical capabilities enable researchers to process vast amounts of data on the blood-brain barrier's complex interactions and structures. By using machine learning algorithms, scientists can now predict how different molecules will interact with the blood-brain barrier, leading to more efficient drug development, especially for neurological conditions. This is where all the magic happens. Yes, uh, this is where part of the magic happened. We're beginning our tour in the biology lab. 
Uh, what you see here is a, a fancy robot, and in each of the tiny wells here is an actual tiny human liver or brain, etc. And you can see that it is programmed to do thousands of these tests automatically, testing many, many drugs that have already been in the clinic. Some of them, after passing all of these tests, are toxic. We want to prevent that same damage happening again. All of this is fully automated. Uh, it took three years, $20 million, a team of interdisciplinary people to really create a fully automated system where, which is fully controlled and run by the AI so that the experiments themselves mm -hmm. are controlled in real time and modified. This really optimizes. So that was the liver. Uh, and here is where the blood-brain barrier uh, is happening. And so um, our scientists are able to create the human blood-brain barrier, that which is within the, uh, the blood vessels in the brain that permits only some things to pass. Uh, and so you can actually individualize the drugs and, and test which drug will work safely for whom. So that's the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so here we see uh, the next station, the brain. Imagine this is an actual miniaturized human brain. It's not a brain that thinks thoughts, thank goodness, but it is a human brain of an individual generated from a blood sample and we can actually see for the first time using AI which drug will work effectively for which patient, for which of us. We're all different, our brains are different, uh, so that's, uh, that's what we're doing. Yeah, so uh, this is where it all comes together. You've seen how the biology happens, and then uh, scientists from different disciplines, nanotechnology, biology, AI, computing, robotics, all brought together allow us to do the magic of having, for the first time, better prediction of which drugs work safely and efficaciously for which yeah. individual. Getting molecules and atoms to interact with each other at a cellular level is just one part of the question. The other part is to collect data and to use that data to actually create a drug that's going to be used to solve a problem and to treat a disease. All this would have never been possible unless it was for the power and the rapid pace at which artificial intelligence is able to look at data, analyze data, and to crunch it. So now we're going to see the AI part. Yes, so we've seen the biology and we've seen the engineering and the software and, and nanosensors. And uh, here is where the data has been collected. Uh, as, as you can see here as an example, uh, data is collected from all of these, we call it multimodal, different sensors, microscopy, etc. And then it is crunched here to have the AI make sense of all of that, allows to determine which drugs uh, work safely uh, for, for whom. And this has several stages uh, to it. And you can see here, this is the, where the uh, computer is controlling the experiment, driven by the AI. It's the AI is, is both driving the experiment and analyzing the, the, the information. And as you can see uh, here, some of the folks are working on various properties of drugs, the uh, uh, pharmacokinetics and the molecular uh, uh, structure and chemical properties. All of these are taken in, into consideration to uh, drive an AI-driven uh, drug development process that is more efficient, uh, safer, faster drugs, uh, more personalized than was before. So Isaac, we've seen a lot today here. You're, you guys are doing incredible work. You know, what do you anticipate over the next few years? How will the industry overall adapt and develop? You know, I think it is really a pivotal moment in history where the industry is now embracing 
these new technologies. You've seen AI, uh, the advanced biology, uh, stem cell technology, nanotechnology, all of this being taken together. Um, the next 10 years, I believe, will see a radical transformation of drug development. Yeah. Uh, drugs will be developed faster than was possible uh, before, and integrating these new technologies, moving away from animal testing, and not eliminating them, but reducing uh, them, and uh, really uh, um, cutting the costs of healthcare, and delivering drugs that are more suited to people, more personalized, and much faster and cheaper than was possible before. Today about 25% of the American population is unable to afford a prescription drug. And the reason for this, the major reason for this, is the cost. The drug industry is, is heavily polarizing and it's a monopoly in many places. For that reason, drug companies actually control the rights to develop drugs and raise the prices. This is the biggest problem in the current and today's pharmaceutical industry. Artificial intelligence offers transformative potential in the realm of drug development by leveraging its ability to analyze vast data sets far beyond human capability. AI can identify patterns and insights that accelerate the discovery of new drugs. It can predict how different chemical compounds will behave and how likely they are to make an effective treatment. This not only speeds up the process of drug discovery, but also increases its accuracy, potentially leading to more effective and safer medications. The science is complex, but uh, the idea is, is really simple. Take uh, hundreds, thousands of known drugs and test them on these miniaturized human organs, the tiny liver, the tiny brain, etc. And since these are drugs that are known, we can, known meaning you know which one of them is safe and which one of them has been found to be unsafe, we test them on these miniaturized human organs, we use nanosensors and microscopy and robotics to collect massive data, which trains the AI so that the, then the AI can, when a new drug comes along, the AI can look at it and say, ah, I've seen already yeah. hundreds of safe drugs. I've seen hundreds of non-safe drugs. I can now discern that this new drug is likely to be uh, uh, safe or unsafe. And what's more important, safe for whom? Mm -hmm. It's not just about uh, because we're all different. Yeah. You know, in fact, when you stop and think about it, drug development until now has not been developed for Englishmen or Frenchmen or people from Israel. It has been developed for an average human being that doesn't really exist. Yeah. That's almost akin to developing pet food for something that's mm, between a cat, a dog, a goldfish, and a giraffe. Yeah, uh, yeah. We're all different. Currently, in um, clinical testing, women are not represented in 50% of the cases. Mm -hmm. Minorities are represented in 11% of, of clinical uh, testing. 92% of all drugs fail in clinical trials mm -hmm. because uh, animal um, are very different from human. Yeah. We're not like mice. Um, and so drugs that succeed in animal testing fail in clinical trials and the other way around. Yeah. In fact, if penicillin was invented today, it would probably be disqualified because it works well in human but not in animal testing. Yeah. The ability to fine tune, to personalize drugs to individual uh, patients um, so that this is not just one pill fits mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. which doesn't really work. I reached out to LA-based music composer, multiple times uh, Emmy Award winning, Lucas Cantor. Lucas had the privilege to work on a very exciting project in the early days of AI being used to work with music. And this project is incredibly beautiful. In every corner of the world, in every culture throughout history, music has been an integral part of human experience. Its origins, lost in the mists of time, are as ancient as humanity itself. 
So let us embark on a journey to understand how this ancient art form is now changing thanks to AI, what the possibilities are and where we are headed. The idea for finishing Schubert's Unfinished Symphony was first brought to me by a friend of mine who's a PhD in uh, Goldsmiths College in London. And this was originally supposed to be an academic exercise, but then Huawei got involved and wanted to fully produce it and make it into a piece of public relations and also into a, into a piece of art. So I wasn't thinking about the implications of what we were doing. I was really just thinking about getting the job done. I was thinking about trying to accomplish the goal that my client had laid out for me and trying to make the best music possible. It wasn't until the piece was finished that I realized that we had accomplished something kind of amazing. I thought I was taking on a musical project and maybe an academic computer science type project. After I had finished it, I realized that it was really a philosophical project and asking what does it mean that an artificial intelligence can write music is a profound question that only raises more questions. Um, it raises the question of what does it mean to write music? What, what is music in the first place? Um, can I prove that I write music? Where does music come from? Technology in my lifetime, anyway, has moved incredibly fast. If J.S. Bach, who died in 1750, sat down at George Gershwin's desk, who was a 20th century composer, his learning curve would have been less steep than if my self in college tried to sit down at my desk today. You know, Bach would have sat down at Gershwin's desk and said, well, here's manuscript paper. This seems to be a pen. Okay, I can write some music. Almost all the technology that I use today didn't exist even when I was in college, and I was in college when the iPod was invented. Schubert's Unfinished Symphony was lost in time and it has been recaptured by artificial intelligence. And that that is a profound and beautiful thing that technology was able to deliver to us. Unfortunately, I don't know if that's entirely true. I think what technology was able to deliver was a suggested way that Schubert might have finished his Unfinished Symphony. And I was able to channel that and arrange that. But Schubert is dead. His symphony was unfinished when he died, and no one is ever going to finish it. The fact that artificial intelligence was able to suggest a possible ending is interesting and is uh, entertaining, but I don't know if it means anything profound for the world of music. It's certainly possible and likely that an AI composer will be able to write music as well or better than I'm able to write music today, but I think that misses the point. Part of my music is having a connection to my audience, having a personal connection to my audience, and part of it is just drawing on my own experiences. So even if there's an artificial intelligence that can create music that is um, beautiful, it won't be the same music that I'm creating. So people can choose to listen to mine or people can choose to listen to the music made by the AI. Whether AI becomes great at writing music or okay at writing music or terrible at writing music, the very fact that it's writing music means that a non-human intelligence is now contributing to the lexicon that future generations will build off of. Moving from music to the machine age, as we delve into the AI-powered world, we cannot underestimate the impact of AI on industry in general. The machine age, a pivotal era in human history, marked a significant shift from traditional hand production methods to the use of machines, fundamentally transforming the landscape of industry and society. This period, which began in the late 18th century with the Industrial Revolution, saw the introduction of groundbreaking technologies such as the steam engine, mechanized textile manufacturing, and later the assembly line. These innovations not only revolutionized production methods, making them faster and more efficient, but also had profound impacts on social structures, urbanization, and the economy. Perhaps it's the right time to ask, what does productivity mean? Is it merely our ability to complete a task more efficiently? Or is it our ability to work with tasks and enjoy them and use technologies such as AI, robotics, and others to do our jobs in a way so that it stresses us less and gets us to do more work as fast as possible. 
There are many things, many ethical, social uh, dilemmas and questions that are being asked about the use of technology and work. Progress in the economy has been triggered by waves of technology. For the first several millennia, most humans lived at subsistence levels, but then with the advent of the steam engine, it ignited the industrial revolution. We're now in the early stages of what Andrew McAfee and I called the second machine age. What's special about this era is that machines are not only doing physical work, but they're also beginning to do mental work, to augment our brains. The second machine age is triggered by computers and now artificial intelligence. These technologies are digital, exponential, and combinatorial. That means that instead of atoms, we now work with bits. And the progress in these technologies is doubling and quadrupling every three to five years. Interestingly, it typically takes five, 10, even 15 or more years from when the technologies are developed in the laboratory to when they start having real impact on economic growth. And so one of the things that we're all waiting for is the productivity impact. Like a lot of people, I've been disappointed that productivity growth hasn't been increasing as fast as it did in the past. In fact, it's growing at a slower rate than it did in the early 2000s. That's what some people, including me, call the productivity paradox. Over the next 10 years, we'll see the end of the productivity paradox as businesses start taking these amazing technologies and putting them into their products, services, and new business processes. But that takes a lot of reinvention. It takes a lot of what we call co-invention, inventing not just new technologies, but also new organizations and new ways of doing business. And that's the job of managers, of entrepreneurs, of policymakers. So it's time for that group to step up to the plate the way the technologists have been stepping up over the past decade. What happens when we fully adopt technologies such as artificial intelligence? And how will that change our society, our work, and our life? Does the advent of an AI age denote that we will be surrounded by robots? Or does it mean we will stop working because our jobs will be fully taken over by technology? Some experts have suggested that an AI-driven future could mean the end of work, or in other words, there will be no need to work. Will AI really reach this potential? To understand this question, I wanted to find someone who could really address robotics, productivity, artificial intelligence, the future of work, and help us understand where we were headed. I spoke with Daniela Russ from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So just picture a world where routine tasks will be taken off your plates. Garbage bins might take themselves out. Drones might deliver fresh produce right to your doorsteps and intelligent agents, whether embodied or not, might help you optimize all aspects of your life. Now, machines can do some tasks much better than humans can. Machines can move with greater precision. Machines can remember much more, better calculations, faster calculations than we can. But machines are also deficient when it comes to being creative with reasoning, uh, with making decisions. Machine learning and robots, we can imagine a future of medicine. Where all the treatment plans are individualized, customized to what the person needs. We can also imagine a future where treatments are much gentler. In fact, in my research, we are exploring a project we call the Mini Origami Surgeon, where the idea is that surgery is now done by swallowing a little surgical tool um, that can deploy once in the stomach and can be. Uh, remote controlled and solve with uh, problems like removing foreign objects or collecting tissue samples or patching wounds um, or taking a, a better look, a better image at a particular point inside the body. Imagine surgery with no pain, no risk of infections and no incisions. That is extraordinary. 
As the planet grows bigger and we are headed towards a global population of 9 billion people in the next few years, what impact will this have on resources and services? Think about food security and the applications of efficiencies in agri-tech or the delivery of healthcare across communities. Will AI become the equalizer we all have been waiting for? I wanted to dig deeper and uh, perhaps ask a more philosophical question about if AI was able to help us do all these incredible things, get more productive and solve all these problems, could AI also be used as a force for good? Could, could AI be used for the social good? I asked this question to Milan Tombe, professor at Harvard University. Here's my conversation with him. Our work has focused on using AI whenever there are limited intervention resources, how to apply them most effectively, how to optimize their use. Consider public health, uh, whether it's HIV prevention or tuberculosis prevention, suicide prevention, these are some of the topics that we've worked on. Often we have limited social worker resources or health worker time available but we want to have a large amount of impact. Some of the topics we have worked on in this context is harnessing the social networks that may be available. These are not Facebook or other kinds of social networks, electronic social networks, but face-to-face -face networks, and how we can use them most effectively in order to spread public awareness about some kinds of public health challenges. Concrete example is work we've done in the past in homeless shelters in Los Angeles. Harnessing the social network of homeless youth, we are able to show that our AI algorithms, which select peer leaders, messengers to spread messages, are far more effective in spreading those messages compared to traditional approaches of spreading this information. And as a result, we can show that HIV testing rates amongst homeless youth have increased in the tests that we've conducted. Or for tuberculosis prevention, this is work that we are doing in collaboration with NGOs in India, where the goal is to ensure that people adhere to taking TB medicine because they're supposed to take this for a long period of time and sometimes they drop off. If we can predict who are going to be high risk patients who are going to drop out of the program, then we can get health workers to intervene more effectively on the high risk patients. And that's Again, something that we are able to show that AI techniques are able to more effectively predict high-risk patients based on past patterns of their taking their medicine. Or suicide prevention where the idea is that we want to train multiple gatekeepers in order to keep an eye out on the community. And we can show that our algorithms are more effective in selecting the right kinds of gatekeepers. In conservation, we have worked on predicting where poachers may set traps so that rangers can effectively remove them and so that there's a significant increase in the numbers of traps or snares that get removed from these parks. So these are just some examples of the kinds of work that can be done in terms of using AI for social good. But the potential here is vast in terms of how AI can be used to amplify the use of our limited resources. AI is also transforming education by providing personalized learning experiences and identifying areas where students need more support, as seen in platforms like Carnegie Learning. Socially, AI is used in fighting biases and improving inclusivity. For example, AI algorithms are being developed to reduce gender and racial bias in hiring processes. However, this requires a collaborative approach among governments, NGOs, and private sectors to ensure ethical and responsible use of AI. What the world has realized and what, these, what scientists and business people have realized is that much of what we call problems in this world is really our ability to understand patterns. And one of the biggest challenges of solving any problem is, is working with other people. Uh, so for us, we believe the fundamental technology of human coordination is where AI can play a fundamental role in allowing us to work better with each other, allowing us to create at a scale that human beings have never been um, able to in the past. The future of work 
would be less about technology, but really more about imagination, more about creativity. And human progress, I think, has been dampened because of this friction of the hows of things. But I think AI is now really allowing us to decouple imagination from the pattern recognitions and the hows. So I see a future where men and women will be judged not, um, not by what they know or who they know, but their ability or the breadth of their imagination. With everything that is happening within AI, people are not hidden from the dangers of AI, from doomsday scenarios where AI takes your job and are unable to fend for yourself, to even bigger catastrophes where AI takes over humanity and we ultimately become a slave nation to technology. What is the correct perspective and an accurate picture? The question becomes, what are we going to do about it? Is it just the technology companies that are responsible for developing AI and us responsible for using systems that have AI in it? I really think we should have a voice of our own, a voice of reason, a voice of collaboration, and perhaps start talking amongst ourselves about the role of AI and where it's headed and where it's taking with it humanity. There's a lot of hype about artificial intelligence, but there's also some real progress. The biggest misconception is that we're going to have artificial general intelligence anytime soon. That's the kind of thing you see in Hollywood with the Terminator, where there's a humanoid machine that can do pretty much everything that humans can do and then some. The reality is we're very far from that, maybe 50 years, maybe a century or more. These powerful, narrow types of machine learning potentially can create enormous productivity gains, a lot of job disruption, health and welfare benefits, but they're not likely to take over the world. They, of course, can also be used for negative purposes. They can amplify the surveillance state. They can be used to increase income inequality. Uh, they can create cybersecurity risks. They can create algorithmic bias and prevent some people from getting jobs or parole or credit that deserve it. So there are many risks as well. As we stand on this frontier of technological innovation, we're reminded of the need for balance. The power of AI must be wielded with responsibility and ethical consideration. So we have to step back and be cautious. Many people spoke about disease management without really knowing what they were talking about. Many people are talking about AI. It becomes fashionable and there is still a major gap between bringing AI into the DNA of the organization and securing that the old model of discovering and developing, Curris is uh, taking a big leap forward. It's uh, science fiction becoming real. And all my life as a leader, I was dreaming to see somehow what Curris is aiming to achieve. So when I listened uh, uh, to, uh, to the leadership of the company, when I saw the data, I was truly amazed. Every time a new technology has been introduced into the world of music, it has been thought to be the harbinger of the end of music as we know it. And this was true when recording was introduced. This was true when recording went from mono to stereo. When the synthesizer was introduced, the synthesizer was supposed to be the end of the orchestra. And there are always these conservative critics who think that, that music is never going to be the same once these new technologies are introduced. And I don't subscribe to their school only because they've never been right. In my mind, tomorrow can be rosy if we put our minds to it in terms of pushing technology in the right way. It is technology, it can be used for good or bad, and it can be done by one scientist alone or just scientists alone or AI researchers alone. This is something whereby collaboratively, a society, we can try and push technology and apply it for good. I believe that learning how to make things, 
how to program are critical for the future. But I would also say that the future is not just about STEM. Equally important is how we communicate, how we collaborate, how we understand each other, how we work together, and how we express around each other through art, through music, through literature, through the finer pleasures in life. The journey of AI is not just about the technology itself, but about us, the people it serves, and our continuous quest for knowledge, improvement, and a better world for generations to come. As we come to a close of this first episode of The Futurist, I really want you to be proud of the era that we are living in, of your contributions to this era of technology and science where new breakthroughs are being made every single day. Start reading more, start exploring more, and start filling your mind with ideas and thoughts and discussions that can help us build a better tomorrow. My name is Ian Khan, I am The Futurist, and thank you for watching this series.